Hey guys, Nick here from The Finer Things. This will be the first in a short series of videos that I'll be conducting on my own while I'm stranded in my upstate New York apartment. Today's topic of conversation is a comparison between various stand mount or bookshelf speakers that I happen to have lying around. Stay tuned. I guess I'll start with what Ahmed and I usually end with, which is, if you like what you see, give us a like. If you like what you hear, subscribe. And if you really like us, tap that bell to get notifications of our latest uploads. We're also on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, so you can check us out there for more related content, some behind the scenes um, and related. Being that I'm stuck in my upstate New York apartment for the next several days, I couldn't help but notice that I have accumulated a large amount of audio gear. In particular, I have about 10 different pairs of stand mount or bookshelf speakers that are at my disposal. Before we get too far into this video, I want to let you know up front that this is going to be a much more technical video than our normal releases from The Finer Things. So if technical videos are what you're into, definitely stay tuned uh, for this video. Uh, we're going to uh, go into a, a deep dive on some of the details of these particular speakers. If technical videos are not your thing though, do be sure to check out some of the other videos that this channel has put out as they're much more of um, overview type videos that don't quite dig as deep as what I'm about to do with this particular video. To give a quick outline of this video, I'm going to start with a brief description of the speakers that are going to be compared. Then I'm going to talk a bit about the system that they're going to be used in for comparison purposes and the testing protocol therein. I'm then going to round it out with a subjective evaluation and a conclusion as to which speakers are going to be kept and which ones are going to be on the chopping block. The first speakers on today's comparison list are actually uh, just behind me right there. They're the uh, Bowers & Wilkins 685S2 in the black ash finish. Uh, these speakers are the largest stand mount speakers that Bowers & Wilkins offered in their 600 series range when they came out. Uh, circa 2013, I'd like to say, and uh, they went up to about 2017 in their production year, uh, being replaced by the 606s and their subsequent anniversary edition, uh, which is the current model. This two-way design features a one-inch double decoupled aluminum dome tweeter and a six and a half inch Kevlar mid-bass driver, Kevlar being the wunderfabrik of the 1970s used in bulletproof vests. The 685S2 is a particularly deep speaker. It measures 12.8 inches deep, which is a good deal deeper than any other speaker that is going to be on today's comparison list. In fact, they're even deeper than my Vienna Acoustics Mozart Grands, which are my reference speakers right now. This speaker has a claimed frequency response of 52 hertz to 22 kilohertz, plus or minus 3 dB, which could explain why the cabinet is so deep Bowers & Wilkins believes that there should not be much baffle or essentially cabinet around the speaker drivers for optimal diffraction. So instead of making the speaker wider to have better cabinet volume, what they've done here is they've made it deeper. Uh, that would certainly make sense for their uh, base response figures here. The impedance of this speaker is claimed by the manufacturer to be 8 ohms nominal uh, or average. However, the manufacturer does also stipulate that the speaker can go as low as 4 ohms, which would indicate that this speaker would benefit from a pretty burly amplifier. The 685S2s retailed for $700 a pair when they were brand new. Next up is the Martin Logan Motion 35 XT, which is right up there. It's the largest stand mount speaker that Martin Logan offers, their current model being the Motion 35 XTI, which brings a new range of finishes and a slightly different aesthetic, but no difference in sonic performance. This speaker has a very unique drive unit for the high frequencies. It is using a one and a quarter by 2.4 inch air motion transformer, um, which is a type of ribbon tweeter. 
uh, that is uh, folded more or less like an accordion and it squeezes back and forth to produce the sound. A uh, bit different, of course, than a dome, which simply moves back and forth. This is definitely going to affect the sonic dispersion characteristics of the higher frequencies, so we should expect to hear a different presentation anyway than what we would see from, let's say, the 685s or any speaker with a standard dome tweeter. The Motion 35 XT also features a 6.5 inch aluminum mid-bass driver and a claimed frequency response of 50 Hz to 25 kilohertz plus or minus 3 dB. This speaker comes in at almost double the cost of the 685 S2s at $1,200 per pair. Having said that, the cabinet finish is a gorgeous dark sherry wood veneer that is one of the most beautiful finishes that I've seen on any reasonably priced speaker. Very good job, Martin Logan. Also, the cabinet, quite a bit heavier duty uh, feeling than what the 685 S2 brings to the table, so definitely kudos there as well. Moving on to the Sony SS CS5 stand mount loudspeaker. That's right, it's that same Sony speaker for $75 a pair that we've made a few videos about it now, and quite frankly, we're just not going to stop making videos about it because it is an exceptional deal in hi fi. However, regardless of the price, it's got to be able to stack up to these speakers, some of which cost almost 20 times as much, so we'll see how its performance does there. The SSCS5 is the only three-way speaker in this particular shootout. It has a 0.67-inch Super Tweeter Silk Dome, a 0.98-inch Silk Dome Tweeter, and it also has a, uh, hang on here, a 5.12 mica reinforced mid-bass driver. Very unique combination of drivers there and uh, will certainly lend to a unique sound when compared to the 685 S2s and the Motion 35 XTs. The claimed frequency response is 53 Hz to 50 kHz with no particular decibel tolerance, so we don't know if it's plus or minus 3 dB, plus or minus 10 dB. Sony doesn't really give us that particular information. Assuming it is plus or minus 3 dB though, it is very similar, surprisingly similar, to the 685 S2s and the Motion 35 XTs, which is really saying something. For more details about the SSCS5 and our comparison between the SSCS5 and the much more expensive Sony SSNA2ES that Ahmed uses in his reference system, check out our video up above. And finally, we have a very unique entrant to this battle royale. The Vienna Acoustics Berg. It is a very small lifestyle stand mount loudspeaker, and it's arguably the most beautiful loudspeaker that is in this comparison. It has this gorgeous aluminum curved cabinet, and it has so much dimensionality to it. it it's, it's really just so unique. It makes all of the other speakers just look like a box. The Bergs are hand-built in Vienna, Austria, as is their company's namesake. They feature a 1-inch silk dome tweeter and a 6-inch mid-bass driver made of a very special material called X3P, which is a type of polypropylene. It's exceptionally light and very, very rigid and allows the speaker to have much more pistonic movement than your average polypropylene speaker. This is a technology that Vienna Acoustics has developed for many of their higher-end speakers as well, such as my Mozart Grands or the Beethoven Concert Grands, etc. The claimed frequency response of the Berg is 70 Hz to 25 kHz, plus or minus 3 dB. The nominal impedance is 4 ohms, so you know this is going to be happy with a high current amplifier with a nice, as Ahmed would put it, big coily boy. Uh, large toroidal transformer in scientific terms. These are also by far the thinnest speakers in this comparison at only 3.8 inches deep. And they're actually designed to be mounted on a wall or they could be stand mounted or set on a piece of furniture as well, making them the most flexible out of any of the speakers here in this comparison. They retail at about $1,000 a pair, which doesn't make them the most expensive speakers here, uh, but it's certainly up there. Now that you've heard a bit about the speakers that I'm going to be comparing, let's talk about how I'm going to compare them. 
I'm going to be assessing these speakers in my living room, which is 13 feet deep by 14 feet wide by 8 feet tall. The rest of the system is composed of a Monster Power HTS 5100 power conditioner, an HP laptop running Rune connected by the AudioQuest Diamond USB, to the Project Prebox S2 Digital, which is connected by AudioQuest McKenzie RCA cables to the Arcam PA240 power amplifier, which has an AudioQuest NRG Z3 power cable and Analysis Plus Silver Oval speaker cables, which connect to the speakers that we'll be comparing. For bass reinforcement, I also have a pair of RHEL S812 subwoofers connected to the PA240 with high pass, which is RHEL's standard connection, and I'm also running AudioQuest NRG Y3 power cables. The speakers will sit on top of a pair of 24-inch speaker stands by Bowers & Wilkins, the STAV24s. They're going to be filled with KEF inert filler, GFSFD, to eliminate resonances from the stands themselves. The stands will be placed approximately 50 inches from the rear wall as to avoid any issues with excess bass energy from the speakers themselves. I will link all of the gear in the description below so that you can take a look at it at your leisure. I selected several tracks that I was going to use to directly compare the speakers to one another. However, I didn't want to limit myself to just those tracks, so while I was listening to the speakers, I kind of just played whatever came to my mind in addition to those main tracks that I would be using for assessment. My streaming service of choice was Kobuz, which was being run through Rune on my HP laptop. I didn't set any time limits for listening to one particular pair of speakers over another. I wanted the swapping back and forth between the speakers to occur naturally and Quite frankly, it occurred very frequently going back and forth between different pairs so that I could have a better understanding of exactly what to tell you my findings were. I decidedly manually swapped the speakers so that they could be in the same exact position of the room, thereby eliminating yet another variable in this particular comparison test. On to the subjective evaluation. I kicked off this comparison test by listening to the Bowers & Wilkins 685 S2s. I've owned Bowers & Wilkins speakers for the past 20 years or so, and I must say that my ears are definitely a bit biased toward their particular sound. However, lately I haven't really listened to many Bowers & Wilkins speakers. I've been listening mostly to the much warmer and laid-back uh, Vienna Acoustics Mozart Grands, and I have to say, going back to the B&Ws, it was, it was a bit of a shock. I was expecting lively and musical sound, which is what I was used to when I was using the Bowers & Wilkins speakers before the Viennas, but this liveliness, the excitement, it just never came to fruition. The sound was pretty bright, it was pretty sterile, it was kind of dead. And in fairness, this is the first speaker that I'm listening to coming off of my $3,500 reference tower speakers, so I decided to give the B&Ws a break and I would come back to them a little bit later, but track after track that I listened to, it, it just didn't move me. It didn't, it didn't give me the sort of excitement and joy that, that I had with B&W loudspeakers before. The sound of the 685 S2s I would characterize as bright and aggressive. The soundstage, very, very small, but I would argue that it is pinpoint accurate. And the bass, while there wasn't a ton of it, was also very resolved, and you could hear a lot of textures down there, which was very nice. And the bass did get quite a bit better when I feathered in my RHEL S812 subwoofers, although admittedly that is usually the case. Those things are absolutely magic. The mid-range wasn't exactly what I would call sweet, but it was neither lean nor bloated, and it had plenty of detail retrieval, which is quite nice. I still couldn't get over how bright the sound signature was. It really bothered my ears, and um, it was just something where even, even going back to it a second time for, for a second round of comparisons, even in different orders, I could tell right away that that really bright sound, it was, you know, that was the B&W sound signature of the 685 S2s, and I just, I wasn't pleased. It, it, it was rather irritating to listen to. As a disclaimer, any of my findings here are obviously going to be limited to my room and my system. Your findings in your room and your system will probably vary from what I am finding. 
Also, being that these are subjective evaluations and not objective evaluations, my personal preferences and biases are obviously going to weigh in on what I feel are the better speakers. Just as a fair disclaimer. Growing tired of the 685 S2s, I swapped over to the Martin Logan Motion 35 XTs. I have to be honest, I was really expecting an astonishingly better experience with the high frequency presentation than with the BMWs. Given that the Martin Logans have tremendously more radiating surface area, it would seem to my objective level of thought anyway that the Motion 35s would be able to more effortlessly create the same amount of sound pressure level that the BMWs were trying to produce. In real world, what ended up happening was that while at the particular frequencies that the BMWs were, were kind of bitey and, and harsh, the Martin Logans were not, there were other frequencies where the Martin Logans kind of, they almost glared at me. It, 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 was, it was a similar harshness, uh, brightness, just at different frequencies and at different upper frequencies um, that just made the whole thing very unenjoyable. Um, not quite to the same extent as the B&Ws, I will say that. Um, also, the vertical soundstage was quite a bit larger on the Motion 35s. The horizontal soundstage, it was about as wide as the BMWs, maybe a touch wider, um, but not as dramatic of a difference as I was hoping. The bass response was about as deep as the BMWs. They dug just about as deep, uh, perhaps maybe a touch deeper. However, it seemed like there might have been a slight loss in resolve down in those lower frequencies where the BMWs maintained this level of resolution and the Martin Logans were just kind of like, oh, hey, I'm producing this frequency, but I'm not really giving you as much useful information there. I will say that the Motion 35s in certain tracks were a bit more generous with bass output, which definitely benefited those particular tracks. Then it was time to move on to the Sony SSCS5s. I had just come off reading an article on audiosciencereview.com about the Sony SSCS5s. For those of you who don't know, Audio Science Review is an extremely objectivist website that essentially takes scientific measurements of the speakers and draws conclusions almost exclusively from that. And essentially what their conclusion was, was that the SSCS5 was a very bright speaker. In fact, I'll quote uh, the gentleman who did the review. He said, the SSCS5s are so bright that if you play music in the dark, you may have to wear sunglasses. Now, I've heard the SSCS5s in a number of different systems and across a number of different rooms and many, many times at this point, and I never really felt that they were bright unless the electronics driving them were particularly bright or brittle. So it was interesting to read these conclusions from audiosciencereview.com. Having said this, just reading that article had kind of this inherent bias um, kind of placed inside my mind where when I set up the SSCS5s, I was expecting them to be really, really bright for some reason. I, I don't know, maybe mimicking those, those particular measurements that I was looking at, the graphs I was looking at where the highs were very tilted. Despite that, despite that expectation bias, we'll call it, the Sonys weren't really all that bright. In fact, compared to the Bowers and Wilkins 685 S2s and the Martin Logan Motion 35 XTs, they were considerably less bright, especially when driven at reasonable volume levels. I will say when you tip the scales, you get over 80 decibels in volume um, continuous. That's where those speakers really start to strain and it just doesn't sound pleasant. But when driven within their capabilities, they're not bright at all. They're, they're very detailed. You can hear a lot of resolution, a lot of resolve, a lot of high frequency textures, but I wouldn't say that they're particularly bright. They actually had pretty reasonable bass response. Their bass response, uh, kind of like their claimed measurement, it pretty much matched up perfectly with the 685s and the Motion 35 XTs. The bass resolution might not be quite of what the BMW was capable of, but I would say it's on par with what the Martin Logans were doing. And the fact that this woofer is more than an inch smaller than what the Martin Logan or BMW has, it was particularly impressive. Now, the Sony SSCS5 is by no means a perfect loudspeaker. 
it has a relatively weak cabinet and if you drive it to particularly high levels you're going to expose some of those cabinet resonances which are pretty well controlled at the lower volume levels. This is obviously not a problem that you're going to run into with the 685 S2s or the Motion 35 XTs. Those have tremendously better built cabinets, especially the Martin Logans. So when it comes to driving speakers to higher levels or if you're placing these stand mount speakers in a large space, that would definitely make a difference. In my relatively small room, however, driving the Sonys within their abilities, I, I never really felt the the want to drive them harder or play them louder. Um, they, they just sounded really good and um, you know I, I, they, they played plenty loud in my room so I, I didn't really um, I didn't really see much of that um, in, in terms of real world listening but yes if I decided to push the volume further I would definitely get those cabinet resonances going there and that's an area where the B&Ws and the Motion 35 XTs uh, certainly set themselves apart. I will also mention again that the 685 S2s and Motion 35 XTs cost somewhere in the order of about 10 to 20 times the amount that the SSCS5s cost when they're on sale. Uh, the B&Ws and the Martin Logans usually don't go on any sort of sale, um, but the Sonys, like clockwork, go from their $150 retail price down to about $75 a pair a few times a year. So you can definitely catch them at the right time. I personally got them at the $75 a pair price, uh, which is pretty darn amazing. But you, you know, you think about what those speakers offer up at their particular price point and what I have to spend to get something which is in some ways not better, actually in some ways quite worse. Uh, the B&Ws being very bright, the Martin Logans having that high frequency glare, you know, just, just the cost of them, $1,200 a pair versus $75 a pair, big, big difference there. Um, obviously, there's pride of ownership. The Bowers & Wilkins, very prestigious brand. The Martin Logan, the build quality is insanely good. It's really, really fantastic. They have these awesome metal grates and everything. Um, so there, there's definitely something to be said there. But at the same time, if you're just thinking about sonic performance of particular speakers, right now uh, the value certainly lies with the Sonys. However, I don't necessarily keep speakers just on value alone, um, so you know I'm definitely taking a look at the um, sonic attributes of the speakers more than anything else. So I then moved on to the Vienna Acoustics Berg loudspeakers. These speakers are by the same company that makes my reference floor standing speakers, Vienna Acoustics. What I've found is that the two of them present very, very similarly. The Berg, obviously, it's a much smaller speaker. It doesn't have the same expansiveness as my uh, Mozart Grand. It doesn't have the same amount of resolve and textures and, and depth to the soundstage and size of soundstage for that matter. But that's to be expected. My floor standards cost three and a half times as much and are a purpose-built loudspeaker, whereas the Bergs are decidedly a lifestyle speaker that is really made to be very flexible in installation, as I talked about before. So no real surprise there. What was surprising was that the tonal balance was tremendously awesome. It was very warm and lush, just like my Mozart Grands, and it still had a great deal of resolution. The resolution matched that of the B&Ws in terms of what they were able to put out. Obviously, going down to only 70 hertz, there was definitely a limit in the bass response to what they can do on their own, and they certainly benefited when I turned on those RHEL S812 subwoofers. And I'll say, they were the best at integrating with the RHEL subwoofers. Um, the other speakers had a much harder time doing so. Um, and I feel like the fullness in the frequency response of, of the Viennas, uh, just their sonic signature, um, really allowed them to work very nicely with the S812s. For such a small speaker, the Bergs also presented excellent dynamic range. There were a couple of recordings that I played that had really wide dynamics and I, I did it on purpose because I wanted to see just how how wide of, of a range these particular speakers had and they just showed out in spades, uh, especially for such a small speaker. But even when you compare them to the B&Ws or the Martin Logans or the Sonys, tremendously better dynamic range. So to sum up my findings in this speaker comparison, I found that on my particular system in my room, based on my preferences, 
the 685 S2s were simply too bright, they were too thin, uh, the vocals were too hollow sounding, they were just disappointing in my particular system. Obviously, if I changed around components, it would be a different story, and I might end up keeping them around just to do a comparison test, maybe on my multi-channel system, just with a different amplifier, different preamp section, different source component, to see if that changes anything, but as of right now, they're on the chopping block. The Motion 35 XTs, while they have a wonderful finish and they did certain things very, very well, were also generally a disappointment and are also on the chopping block. The Sony SSCS5's tremendous value. Overall, I, I would say their performance potential, maybe not quite to the level of the BMWs or the uh, Martin Logans if you were to do like an overall preference rating, but they just did so many things right and because they were so dirt cheap i just have no reason to get rid of them so they're definitely staying on and the vienna acoustic berg are are probably going to be um at least in this size and price range they're going to be my reference stand mount speaker i do also have a pair of the vienna acoustics weberns which is essentially a berg only it's taller it has two six inch woofers as opposed to a single and I broke those out earlier today just to give them a test, and boy, they are something special as well. Uh, I'll definitely be enjoying both of those. They're really fantastic. So guys, if you've made it this far, thank you so much for having a watch of my review of a few stand mount speakers that I happen to have here. It's really been a blast for me to make this video, and I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Stay tuned, stay tipsy, and stay classy. Look forward to more content from The Finer Things.